Hey everyone, welcome to church. I'm so glad you guys chose to join us today. Hey, real quick before we get started with service, I just want to let you know how it's going to go. Uh, we actually have Pastor Tim leading us in worship this week, so that's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm going to come back and give a quick announcement. Then we have Pastor Jason with the message today. Man, I really hope and pray that this service blesses you uh, wherever you're at today. So why don't we just go ahead and take a second and prepare our hearts for what God might want to say with us in worship. Man, I really hope you're blessed again and encouraged by this week's service. Well, hey guys, we're excited to worship together here. I'm with my wife, Elizabeth, and Katie over here, and we're excited to worship with you guys here today. And you know, something about worship is no matter where you find yourself, um, there's something about worship that's powerful. In fact, there's this really cool story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And the king, they're getting ready to go out to battle. And here's what King Jehoshaphat does. It says, he appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And they went on to win the victory. And, and there's something about worship that's just powerful in our lives in those times when we can kind of detach from the things that we're, we're feeling and the weight that we're carrying and just focus on who he is and give him praise and give him honor. And so I hope as we worship together, I want to encourage you just to lean in and to engage wherever you're at and maybe close your eyes. I know maybe kids running around, just close your eyes and focus and worship. And let's ask him to move in our hearts as we worship him. God. 
I don't feel that you're working Never stop, you never stop working Never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working you never stop, you never stop oh. Even when I don't see it, you're working even when I don't feel it, you're working It never stop, you never stop working It never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop for oh, We make a miracle work Oh, God. 
Hey everyone, thank you so much for worshiping with us. I have this awesome opportunity I just wanna share with you guys before we continue on with service. As many of you know, uh, we have been partnering with Community Food Bank over the last few weeks to help people in need. The cool thing about this is that instead of people having to go to the food bank to get their needs met, we are actually bringing the food bank to them. And so if you wanna be a part of this, I just wanna encourage you guys to go to lifegj.org forward slash help to sign up. And uh, you know, our website is also our one-stop shop for church online, ways to be generous. And uh, we have some awesome new kids content there each week. And so I just wanna encourage you to go ahead and check that out. Now here's Jason with the message. Hey guys, man, I am so glad that we are able to get together again and to lean into what God has for us today. Before we even get started, why don't we pray together? Lord, we're thankful that, um, that you're willing to meet us where we're at uh, in our living rooms or, or wherever it is that we're able to, to engage with you and with your word. And so we just pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to be receptive to the truth that you have for us today. And then um, Holy Spirit, we invite you to make the change in us so that we don't just hear, but we do, and we're, we, we become doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, real quick, um, I want you guys to, to imagine, let's say a Tuesday back in January. Just in your mind's eye, picture what um, a Tuesday afternoon felt like back in this January. You got it? Now, can you remember last Tuesday? This Tuesday, and that was different, wasn't it? So much has changed lately, right? Like we had this routine, my guess is um, back in January, you had your normal life going on. Maybe you were at work or you were with your kids or you were doing errands and it felt so normal. And my guess is that by this last Tuesday, things feel so different, don't they? And see, in the midst of all of this change, I'm starting to feel really weird. I'm starting to feel some, some stress, some pressure. And as I was wrestling through what I'm dealing with, I kind of had an aha moment. And I want to share that with you guys. And I want that to be kind of where we start our talk today. So over the last couple of weeks, I've really been struggling with like, what's, what is this weird feeling in me? I haven't lost my job. Right? I know that some of you guys are really worried right now because your job is up in the air or you haven't been able to go to work. And, and that's not me. And so I, I'm really thankful. And at the same time, I feel really weird. And so as I started to process it, what I realized is through this season, I've discovered that I'm struggling with my purpose. And the reason that I'm struggling with it, after really thinking about it, after trying to, to, to hone in on what, what could be the, the reason for that, I've discovered I think that my sense of purpose was actually found in what I was able to accomplish. And you see, every week at church, there's a rhythm and there's a weekend service and we have to be able to put that on and it takes planning all week and we have benchmarks and then we have the service itself Saturday, again Sunday. And then we have youth group, that happens on Wednesdays. And then we have life group curriculum and we have the life groups themselves that are meeting throughout the week and there's always something happening. And so I'm usually able to either look back and say, I just finished something or I'm able to look forward and see what's coming that I have to work on. And that sense of constant accomplishment gave me purpose. Now that rhythm has been completely upended. And suddenly I was left feeling like I, I don't really have purpose. And it was because something was taken away from me. And what was taken away from me really wasn't my purpose, but it was where my purpose was found. And that is that rhythm. And you know, sometimes we don't see important things in our life until it's taken away from us, do we? You know, you, you know that old saying, you don't know what you have until it's gone? See, this is an unprecedented time where everybody is experiencing this pandemic. We're all in this stay at home order and everything is different for all of us. And for so much of us, we didn't realize what we had and now it's gone. So many things have been taken from us. So what are you struggling with? 
When you think about that Tuesday back in January and how life was normal compared to last Tuesday, what is it that hurts the most about the change? You know, for you, maybe, maybe it's the, the very real possibility that you're not going to be able to pay rent next month. Maybe you've got a, a business, a local business, and you're not even sure you're going to be able to keep the doors open when all of this is over and the stress is starting to, to pile up and the uncertainty. Or you're not sure if your employer is going to be able to bring you back. Like, is the business you work for even going to be there? Maybe you have this sense of aimlessness that like, the world is just passing you by and you're stuck at home and you don't know what to do with this. Or maybe you're stuck at home 24-7 with people that you don't really want to be with. And it's a social thing for you. You, would, you need to get out. You need an outlet. You need a place to go and something to do to feel normal and you just can't right now. What is it that bothers you the most in this season? See, the reality is that we're all feeling kind of weird, right? We're all feeling this anxiety we're all feeling this sense of restlessness. And the reason is that underneath all of that, we all want a life that's full of joy, that's full of peace, and that has a sense of purpose. What if this plague, for lack of a better word, what if this plague that we're experiencing right now is exposing in our hearts the ways that we've been trying to find those things? the ways that we've been trying to find joy or peace or purpose. See how interesting I think it is that, that we're in the middle of a, a study in the book of Exodus and we're coming up on the plagues. Now, I have to admit, back at the beginning of the year, whenever we sat down and we planned all of this out, um, when you think about preaching the plagues, one of the things that we had to wrestle with was like, how are we possibly going to make this relevant? Well, guess what? It's suddenly become all too relevant in our lives, hasn't it? If there's ever been a time in my life where I could identify with the plagues of Egypt, it's now. And so this crazy timing, I think, is, is God's timing. And so we're going to lean into this. I know that we're all kind of tired of talking about this coronavirus thing. And yet the reality is this is where we're in in Exodus and man, is it appropriate. And so let's talk about the plagues really quick. Now, the first thing is there were 10 different plagues. And so you may not know what they all are. I'm just going to go through them real quick. There was uh, the, the river that turned to blood. And then after that, it was frogs. And then God plagued the nation of Israel with gnats and flies and boils. And then the livestock died. And then there was hail and locusts all the way to the point that the firstborn of everybody in the nation died. Ten plagues. And those ten plagues were each directly connected to one of the gods that they worshipped, right? And so there was this god, Happy, who was the god of the Nile. And so the first plague, the one where God turns the water of the Nile into blood, was an, a, a direct attack or a, a direct confrontation with their god, Happy, right? All the way to the point that even Pharaoh thought that he was a god. And so by the time we get to the end of this, the godness of Pharaoh is confronted in the plagues. And so the reality is that each one of these gods that, that Egypt worshipped, they were a source of joy, of life, of purpose. And the reality is in this season right now, I feel like some of our sources of joy and purpose and peace are being confronted as well, aren't they? And for us, it might be something like the government. Right? And I think that that sounds kind of silly at first because most of us spend a lot of time laughing at our government and ridiculing them. But the reality is the moment that this virus pandemic swept through our nation, we're looking to our government to solve the problem, aren't we? Or maybe it's in Wall Street and we have a lot of security built into our finances and how they're invested. And then in a matter of weeks, we watched Wall Street tumble and our investments lose money. And maybe it's our jobs, maybe it's our social circles, maybe it's even going to church. And yet all of these things have been kind of stripped from us. And so here's what I want to do. As we look at the plagues today, I'm not going to talk about each one. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in detail. You should 
have a little bit of extra time right now. I'm hoping that you're able to use some of your time at home right now, and you could read this entire section of Exodus from chapter 7 to chapter 11, okay? And so you should be able to read that. I would love for you to. That's kind of your homework assignment. And then also I'll post in, uh, I'll post somewhere that we have the list of the plagues and the related gods so that you can learn about that a little bit more too. But I want to zoom out a little bit and look at this whole section for what it is. And the reality is that this is God's response to a question that Pharaoh had. Pharaoh asked way back in chapter five, whenever Moses was first standing in his throne room, demanding the release of the nation of Israel, Pharaoh said, well, who's the Lord that I should obey him? Who is this God? I'm a God. We have lots of gods, but I don't know that God. Why should I obey him? And so all of these plagues are God's response to that question when Pharaoh says, well, who's God that I should obey him? And so we're going to break down the 10 plagues into three different categories. And we're going to find those or, or sections. And we're going to find those sections when God says, I am the Lord. Let's look at the first one together. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 4, he says, Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. And so the first time that God responds to Pharaoh's question of who are you? He says, I am the Lord and I can do things that you can't do. What we see in this first section of the plagues, the first three plagues, is that while God is showing himself to Pharaoh and to Egypt, Pharaoh has his magicians trying to keep up. And so God turns the river into blood. And in that moment, you would think, wow, I can't believe that the mighty Nile has turned into blood. And yet Pharaoh turns to his magicians and they say, well, we can do that. And then somehow with their magic arts, they're able to turn water into blood too. And so Pharaoh hardens his heart. And the next one is frogs. And so God brings frogs out of the river. And we're not talking like on the shore everywhere. They were in the ovens. They were in the kneading bowls. They were in their beds. They were on them. Imagine frogs everywhere. And as gross as that was, and as frustrating as that would be, Pharaoh turns to his magicians and they're like, oh, I mean, we can make frogs come out of the water. Watch this. And they do. And so again, Pharaoh hardens his heart. And it's finally at the third plague when God curses the dust of the ground and it becomes gnats or your translation might say lice. Imagine all of the dust of an entire region being cursed and suddenly becoming creepy, crawly, little bitty bugs. And I don't know if you've ever been like on a camping trip or maybe you're in your backyard and you have one gnat that's bothering you, one gnat that's like buzzing around in your eyelashes and trying to crawl in the corner of your mouth and it is obnoxious. Now imagine the entire land covered in gnats. And it's at this point that the magicians who are trying to keep up with God, they turn to Pharaoh and they go, this is the very finger of God. We can't do this. And it's at that point that God is able to display to Pharaoh, you want to know who I am? You want to know why you should obey me? Because I can do things that you can't do. When I say I'm the Lord, it means I'm different than you. So you don't think you have to obey me because you think you're just as able. You think you are just as capable. Yeah, you think you're a God. You think you can take care of yourself. And you can't. There's a difference between us. When I say I'm the Lord, it's because I can do something you can't do. And the, the reality is that's true in our life too, isn't it? There are times in our life where I think we decide I don't need to follow God because I'm the master of my own ship. I can decide what I'm going to do and not do. I have control in my life. And we set ourselves up as the one who manages and decides and does. And the reality is that God says sometimes, look, I'm the Lord, not you. And I can do things you can't do. And so that's the first section of the plagues. And then again, we see God say, I am the Lord. And we see it in Exodus 8, 22. He says, 
But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, there it is, am in this land. You see, Goshen was this area in Egypt where Israel, the people of Israel, got to live separate from the Egyptians. And God was sending another plague, a fourth plague, and this time it was flies everywhere, right? But God says, just so that you know that I'm the Lord, I'm not just going to send flies. I'm going to send flies on you, but not on my people, not on their land. I'm going to make a distinction. And what we see for the next several plagues is that in this section of the plagues, there is a distinction between Egypt and Israel. In every one of these plagues, Egypt is afflicted and Israel is spared. And it's as if God is saying, I am the Lord and I will protect my people. When you ask me why you should have to obey me, Pharaoh, it's because I'm the God that protects my people. And that reminds me of this story. Billy Graham once wrote about this, this missionary named John Patton. And he was a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands. And so when, when he was at his mission station one night, a, a group of um, tribesmen circled his house with him and his wife in there. And they were going to kill him. They were going to attack. And all through the night, Mr. Patton and his wife were just praying fervently for deliverance and they were seeking God for protection. And when dawn came and the light shone around them, they realized that this entire tribe had gone in the night. Now, a few weeks later, the chief of that tribe was converted to Christianity and he accepted Jesus. And hearing about it, Mr. Patton found him and he said, hey, I don't know if you remember me or not, but I was in that, that house that you guys were around. What, why didn't you come attack us? Why didn't you kill us? And he said, well, you had so many people standing around the house. You had so many guards we would have lost. And he said, well, no, I was, it was just me and my wife. I was alone. And the chief insisted. He said, no, your entire house was surrounded by large men who were armed that night. And it dawned on the reverend that God had protected him, that God had sent his angels to protect him that night. And see, that's the heart of our God. Our God has a heart to protect his people. Now, does that mean that we have license to do dumb things and to say, God's got this? No. And does that mean that we're always going to be spared from calamity? No. But it is in the very character and nature of our God to be a God that looks out for and protects his people. And so with all of these plagues, we see a distinction between Egypt and Israel as if to say to Pharaoh, you don't get to touch my people. And then he says it again. He says, I am the Lord another time. In chapter 9, verse 14, he says, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. Or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Imagine that terrifying moment when God says to Pharaoh, now I'm going to send the full force of my plagues against you. Like I could have wiped you out, but I'm doing this so that you may know, there it is again, that there is no one like me in all the earth. As if he says, if you want to know why to obey me, obey me because I am the Lord and there is no one, there are no substitutes for me not even you. And he looks Pharaoh in the eye. Imagine God looking Pharaoh in the eye and saying, not even you. There are no other gods than me. And so with this, the full wrath, his full, the fullness of the plagues comes and it begins with hail, right? And you can imagine when we say a biblical hail storm, right? Like I, I had hail at my house yesterday, I didn't think much of it, right? I think most of us, when we experience a hailstorm, we just are like, well, I may have to call my insurance company 
right? I'm not sure if I'm going to need a new roof or maybe they're going to have to total my car. They didn't have hail insurance in ancient Egypt. This hailstorm destroyed everything. It tore every leaf apart. It ruined every plant. And the people who got word ahead of time were able to bring their livestock in. But if your animals were in the field, they didn't make it. And right after that, you can imagine after the terror of that hailstorm, God sends locusts. Now these locusts came and they devoured what was left. Anything that was green was eaten. You can imagine swarms of locusts everywhere. And then after that, it was darkness. Now remember I said at the beginning that, that each one of these plagues directly was a direct confrontation with one of the gods of Egypt. Imagine Ra, the sun god, one of the most important gods of Egypt. And God says, not even Ra has power like I do. And he blots out the sun's light, but not in Goshen, not where Israel is, just where the Egyptians are. And in all of that fury, in all of that fullness, we see it building to one epic moment, one terrible moment. When God says, Pharaoh, you're not a God either. In fact, all of the firstborn in Egypt are going to die all the way into the palace. Your son is gonna die. And you can imagine Pharaoh at this point, it's like, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe some of the people out in the streets, like, I, yeah, apparently you've got some power, but not me. And you don't see any, any evidence of him being repentant or sorry for this ahead of time. And yet, God needed to show that there were no substitutes for him. And so the firstborn, die in the night. And the nation of Israel escapes this plague with the Passover that we still celebrate to this day. The reality is that what God was saying in this moment is that he will allow things to be taken away in order to prove that he is the only true and lasting source of joy and peace and fulfillment in life. That there are truly no substitutes for him. So in all of this, all of these things get taken away from Pharaoh and from Egypt in order to display where he, he and his people had been putting their trust when they should have been listening to and obeying God. God does say it one more time when he says, I am the Lord. In the midst of all these plagues, he doesn't say it to Pharaoh. He says it one more time and he says it to Moses in chapter 10. Verse two to Moses, he says that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them that you may know that I am the Lord. So here's the reality that God did all of this, not just to show Pharaoh, but to show the entire nation of Israel that God was worth following, that God was the only source of, for life, And so he was willing to demonstrate in front of them what it was like to have everything else stripped away. He does all this so that the nation of Israel would build their culture on the truth that God is the source of joy. God is the source of peace and purpose. And he says, let this be a marker for you guys. Let this beginning point be a, a time when you realize that you shouldn't be building your culture on anything but me. And he wants that same thing for us. But in order to get us there, he is willing to strip away from us the things that have taken his place. Now, before we close, I want you guys to see one more thing in this plague uh, section of scripture. I want you to notice how Pharaoh tended to respond every time that there was a plague. See, at the beginning, what would happen is he would be exposed. The plague would happen and it would be exposed that whatever he was trusting in wasn't as important, wasn't as valuable, wasn't as necessary as God was. And in that exposure, when it was all stripped away, a lot of times he would actually run toward God. The, the plague of hail is a great example. In chapter 9, verse 27, check this out. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron 
And he said, this time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. And in that moment, when everything was taken from him and he realizes his need for God, he runs toward God. And then there's a respite. And then the hail stops and everything gets better. And he hardens his heart again. So look just a few verses down in verse 34. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. See, he got in this cycle of needing God when it was bad. But when everything got good again, he felt like he could handle it without obeying the Lord. He felt like life was in his control again, or there were other options out there. And so while he needed God in his pain, the moment his pain was gone, he was okay and he hardened his heart time after time. And so if we were going to put a bow on all this, if we were going to kind of wrap up this section of scripture that talks about the plagues, these are the things that I would want us to learn. God wants to be the one that you trust the most for your well-being, right? He's willing to, to let you see in this season that you should trust him more than your job, more than the stock market, more than the economy, he wants to be the one that you trust the most for your joy too. And so he's willing to strip things away or have things stripped away so that you would see, man, I put a lot of stock in, in the joy in my life was found in my social circle or my friends or my hobbies. And he says, look, I should be the primary source for your joy. And he wants you to be the one that you, he wants to be the one that you trust the most for your peace and for your purpose too. And when all these other things that we've been chasing after are stripped away, that exposes our hearts. And it shows us that we've really been trusting in other things, haven't we? And listen, I'm not saying that that's an idol. I'm not saying that you go to work and actually like worship your income. A lot of you guys, um, you're, you work very hard or have a very successful business so that you can be generous, so that you can do kingdom things. And that is so good. This isn't a question of idolatry. This is a question of trust. Are you trusting God for joy and peace and purpose? Or have we started trusting other things, right? For me, it was finding my purpose in accomplishing things, feeling like I, had, uh, I was able to check off lists and because I had done something or had something else to do, right? And listen, I'm a pastor. I work at a church. If I deal with this, I'm going to guess you deal with this. So I want you to just think for a moment about what hurts the most in this season and ask yourself, is this something that God is exposing in me? What is it for you, right? Is there anxiety because of the finances? Maybe that's not you, but maybe you are going stir crazy because you don't like your kids enough to hang out with them 24 hours a day. Maybe you can't handle not seeing your friends. Maybe you're so bored by yourself. What is it for you? What is it that hurts the most? And then what I want us to do with that is once we've discovered that thing that's exposed in us, I want you to ask yourself, what does God want to do in my heart in this season? What, what areas does he want me to, to change the way that I've been thinking and believe and trust him? What does God want to do in your heart in this season? But here's the problem. I think you could get all the way through those two things and then if we're not careful, we're going to do exactly what Pharaoh did, right? During the pain, we're going to lean in. We're going to trust God. We're going to discover how much we need and we're going to discover where we've been trusting other things. And we're going to say, yes, God, I need you here. I need you for that. But then once it's all over and we go back to normal, we're going to harden our hearts and we're going to start trusting those things again if we're not careful. I know you will. I will. It's the way we're wired, right? We need to treat this time like God was hoping the Israelites would. Set up a marker in our life for generations to come where our family could look back and say, do you remember that time that we were all stuck in our homes? Do you remember the coronavirus pandemic? 
man, things changed in me. Things changed in my family. And I realized I wasn't trusting God, but we do now. We need to let this time be a marker. And so as we close, I want to ask you guys, what do you guys want your Tuesday to look like six months from now? Five years from now? What do you want your kids' Tuesdays to look like? Is it the rhythm? Is it the routine? Is it a sense of success? Or is it a sense of peace and purpose and joy that is found from a God that is God regardless of our circumstances? Because maybe that Tuesday is a good Tuesday and maybe it's not. Why don't we pray? Lord, we're thankful for the plagues. And I pray that as each of us are led, we would study them even more. But I'm thankful for this overall truth that through it, it's revealed that there are so many things that we put in our lives as substitutes for you when we should be finding our joy and our peace and our purpose in you alone. Would you search our hearts and reveal to us ways in this season? Expose in us ways in this season that we have been trusting something else. We're going to repent of those things. And then, Lord, would you build a rhythm in our life based on this time that we would be different because of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for our service this week. As always, you can go to our website for more kids' resources and online giving. We'll see you next week. Oh, oh, is it going? It's been going this whole time? <sighs> Jar head. Now I'm all embarrassed. <laughs> ah! Nice You're wasting! So anyway, I have one announcement for you guys. It's this. <laughs> Complete radio hoops. <laughs> <laughs> Of course you will.